Welcome to Legal Innovation Spotlight, the podcast that brings you the latest advancements in legal tech and knowledge management. I'm Ted Theodoropoulos, and I connect with the industry's brightest minds to provide you with valuable insights and actionable takeaways. So sit back, relax, and let's dive in. Laura, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Ted. Good. I appreciate you coming on the show and spending a few minutes with me today to, to talk about innovation and legal. Sounds cool. <laughs> nice, nice way to pass a Friday afternoon. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I, you and I kind of came in contact through a common associate in the uh, legal innovation space, and I took a look at your background, and which I found to be interesting. It looked like you come from a quantitative background with chemical engineering, and then uh, I saw that you had a PhD in innovation management, which I didn't even know that was possible. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and what you what you're doing now with the Organizing for Innovation uh, initiative? Okay, so yeah, so I'm a chemical engineer by training. I wanted to make the planet greener and worked for one of the large construction firms, like the billion dollar installation projects. And was recognized, and at the time they called it like a performance consultant, but basically he was an innovation manager. And in that function, I learned very quickly there were lots of ideas, but they always told Floor, to me, Floor, next project. <laughs> so that drove me to kind of like read a, read a bit more about how innovation management, what it's about. And I learned quickly that in at the engineering firm and later on, like the same is for law firms in professional service organizations it's just they operate so differently that all the innovation theories didn't seem to apply so that meant that i reached out to the erasmus university to the rotterdam school of management to see if i could do a phd and that started like how do you innovate in engineering firms and over the years that has become kind of my specialties how do you manage and organize for innovation in the professional services yeah and and what what about um, organizing for innovation? What what sort of work are are you doing there today? Is I started organizing for innovation now about well that literally ten years ago because I saw that many professionals have like lawyers, uh, physicians, engineers. They have they're smart people, so they have ideas on how to improve their practice, their profession. But they often get stuck because they, they don't know how to how to go about it. And at the same time, I also saw that many innovation managers in these organizations were really struggling uh, because they didn't have like the tools they needed to kind of provide support. So um, I set out first as a consultancy, but always with in mind, like I wanted to have this, this platform because I thought like you need... You need to have structure, but you also need to da have data to see the, the performance and the progress of these projects and to help these innovators to guide them along. So that's where we are today. We are a software provider that provides support software for innovation project teams so that it makes it really easy for lawyers if they have a, an idea, like it just kind of guides them through the process. And for innovation managers, it helps them to kind of focus on the things they love doing is provide like support and, and help these teams keep moving and, and get all the challenges out of the way so they can focus on that instead of having to tell the same story over and over again to like early stage teams or having to put a lot of time and effort in teams that won't go anywhere. So we just have to provide them with the, the information and the data that can show like which teams they should focus on. Interesting. So why, why legal? Why did you, what, what, what brought you to legal? Because when I think of legal historically, and I'm going to generalize here a bit, uh, but this generalization uh, is, is out there for a reason. Um, the law firms have historically not been the most innovative um, uh, industry, uh, we'll say. So what, what about legal attracted you or did you kind of fall into it like I did? Well, it was interesting that you say it. It was in 2008 already. So it must have been one of the first Financial Times Innovative Lawyers. Alan and Overy had one. And I was, at the time I worked for the, I was a professor at the Fleury Business School. And they were asked to do a keynote. And so they soon figured like, Floor, you. 
isn't that what you do? And I was like, okay. I, and till then I'd never been um, involved in, in law firms. So I had then exactly the same idea, hmm, innovation in law firms. What does that entail? <laughs> Um, so since then, I've kind of like followed the industry along, but it has, it was something like not much was happening. Uh, there was not much appetite uh, from the industry either. At least that's how it felt for me. And only I think since the pandemic, um, prior to the pandemic, we were more involved, I've got to say, in, in healthcare. So we're also kind of like looking for um, alternatives of alternative industries. And um, yeah, there's been since so much movement and especially now we see like now like a second wave with generative ai that seems to also put a lot of f emphasis on innovation at least makes people think like what should what can we and should we be doing yeah i've been challenged before by innovation folks within legal to say well what, what data do you have to support that legal is not innovative and one metric you could look at i think there are a lot of different ways you could measure the amount of innovation going on in a particular vertical is technology spend. Um, tech, uh, law firms are uh, historically have been, have underinvested by, by most measures. Uh, I forget if this was an ILTA number, somewhere along the lines in the last 15 years, I, I came across a number 1.5% is on average what law firms spend for external IT. And to put that in perspective, financial services are in the low, uh, low teens. So, you know, that's one way that you could measure. I mean, not every innovation has to involve technology, but I think that more times than not, it does um, in our realm. But what, yeah, I mean, what do you see as the, as the role of innovation in legal, specifically law firms. I don't know if you do in-house work, but and we have some in-house counsel as within our audience, but I think it's mostly law firms. Where, how, what do you see the role of innovation uh, within that context? For me, the role of innovation is really about growth and profitability. That's what it should be. Um, but I'm the first to say, and I think you are relatively generous in your numbers because I think the 1.5% like not all work that all investments in IT um, are innovation either. So <laughs> I think it goes both ways. For sure. And it used to be way worse. Like I think if you look at the traditional R&D stats, it's like 0.1% or something like that. So um, in any case, innovation is in, in general, it's you don't innovate to innovate. And yet and that's what I found fascinating about law firms. I think quite a few do exactly that. <laughs> in the sense that they hire a chief innovation officer and they don't really seem to care, if I may be honest, what that person does, like the true innovation theater, but they get away with it. So if that brings you more revenue, who am I to say that you should evolve, involve like a lot of activity around that if, if for your clients, they just believe the moment you have someone with that title in the organization, innovation is going to happen. So, um, and we can, how do you say that? So if that works for you, like, awesome. <laughs> That's very cheap. Um, that to be said, I think what we see now a trend is where the technology is making such leaps and bounds is that most firms have seen that, hey, if you just play the theater, some clients will kind of like uh, see through that, but especially associates will see through that. So to attract talents, you, I think nowadays need to have a pretty good uh, tech stack because they're not going to work with for an, an attorney that still works with like Manila folders. So I yeah. think that's where most firms currently are is like, Hey, we need to, we need to embrace technology. And, um, and that's, that's how they seem to be going about it. So there, I think in that sense, it's a little lost. Like, why do you want to embrace it? If it's just to tr attract talent and, and uh, clients, fair enough. But I think where you will see, and some firms are, are getting there is the next wave is will, will be like, how can all this IT help us? in our operations, in our profitability and in our growth. 
And um, that, of course, rise, requires a lot of more sophistication because that means that you not only start to look at like the billable hours, but also at the cost structure. And again, like the trend of legal operations, it's that where your firms start to recognize like not all matters are the same. Some things cost a lot more. How do you attribute cost? That's that's a tricky question in a law firm in any case, but that's the kind of stuff that you need to know um, when you want to be a really effective innovator. Like, where are you losing money? What are expensive matters? Where do you have a lot of write-offs? Where do you have a lot of, not even write-offs or write-downs, but where do people kind of like spend a lot of extra time that they don't even may be willing to register? Uh, which is something that especially, of course, happens at the associate level. So I think slowly with more and more data insights that's creeping into firms and chief operating officers that are uh, coming to play, firms start to recognize that there is a lot more that they can be done. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, I, I think that, and the reason I brought that up was we, we mentioned AI, and I do think that that has changed the paradigm and the perspective of law firm leadership on you know, um, the appropriate levels of investment with technology. And I also think that AI is going to put pressure on the billable hour um, because there's going to be investment in infrastructure that will need to be made with respect to Gen AI that they're going to have to recoup somehow. So how to do that, you know, one way is obviously a value-based pricing, you know, alternative fee structures and um you know the firms that gain the most efficiencies have the most to win um so i think that's has changed the entire perspective and now you have it and we're in a very interesting kind of crossroads right now because you have some firms that have banned gen ai outright and pu done it publicly, which is really interesting to me. And then you've got clients who are asking in their RFPs how the, how firms are gaining efficiencies with respect to, to Gen AI. So it's kind of a push pull, and eventually we know what's going to happen here, right? Firms are going to embrace it. You're, it's 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 not not going to happen, but when and how is uh, is TBD, but I do think, and I don't, I'm not sure if you'd agree that the um, willingness for you know executive committees to write checks has increased since over the last two years. I think the awareness has increased. I'm not so sure the willingness has increased. Um, I think. Well, I love Gen AI because it's it's starting to kind of like illustrate how difficult innovation is in a law firm, how costly it often is, and how not to go about it. So uh, for me, this, <laughs> these, are, these are very, for us as a firm, these are very interesting times. Um, so to start, like willingness to write checks, yes. But at the same time, I think firms also start to realize that it's a very difficult, very expensive approach to, to innovation. Because if any partner at any time can say, I want this software, um, you'll end up with a graveyard of software that is underutilized. And I think a lot of firms starting to see that and are starting to give some pushback, which is already very, very challenging. Beyond where we normally, uh, how do you say, the, like strategy or like even macro level thinking, I can imagine that all this thinking has also is going to change how tight lawyers are to the law firm. Because the more it becomes, um, how do you say that? Their data is now in the DMS. If you have a large language model and if you have, uh, or templates or other um, tools that work for you, those are not that easily to move. So I think what you will see is that it firms clients will be more attracted to the firm instead of like the lawyers. And that makes it then easier to also give some pushback at a certain point to say to, to a partner, say like, Hey, <laughs> you can't have everything. It's not a candy store. And, um, and again, like also with those insights in what things cost, 
that's I think where we are slowly just starting to scratch the surface. But that that requires a lot of discipline to get there. And where you see is that most firms find out the hard way. So take for instance like generative AI. They jump on the bandwagon. They get a very expensive license, especially the early stages. The licenses were even more expensive. Um, they ran a pilot. All the law attorneys said, we must have this. And then two months later, no one is using it. And, um, and no wonder, because it's, it's a thing that you get. And they never thought about, like, what should that thing do for them? And so then people start to complain, hey, we have here a fantastic, like, <coughs> let me backpedal there. So you, you, if you get a thing, um, gen AI, then you will find everything that's flawed about the idea, um, about it, especially if it doesn't perform right away. So at least that's what we often see. Like, um, they will complain about anything, about the color, but if you don't like it, you will find stuff. Um, and gen AI is not perfect. So the prompting takes time. So if you just do it the first time, and we see that if we run pilots, like, no one likes it at first. Everyone runs into challenges. It takes some while to get the prompting right. So you really kind of like need, need some momentum to get through that. And if it's just about trying the tool out, they will give up first, first, yeah, with the first resistance. And then there's no one to give some pushback. Whereas if you would set these projects up differently and say like, hey, Gen AI and all these tools, that seems really awesome. What can we do with that as firm? Like what problem can it solve for us? And I can see like some say like productivity uh, challenges. Well, with the billable hour, what kind of productivity challenges? So you already need to be more nuanced. Like what specific problem are you going to solve for the, for the law firm? And usually it then gets to in the, into the realm of like non-billable work. Well, that means that you set your pilot already up very differently because then you're going to look like how can whatever the AI tool, can Harvey or a cloud or, or whatever it is, like how can it help us in that aspect? So you need to make sure that when you do your pilot, that you do that kind of work, um, test it out with your associates, and then you can see does, does it do that work or not? And if the, if the demand from the top comes, like we would love to increase our productivity by 1%, even if the tool is half-baked and just can do 0.5%, you probably will still will be pushing it further because your 0.5% there on the 1% uh, productivity improvement that you're looking for. And then even if it's then a little flawed, you know that it helps. So then typically what we see then is more willingness to kind of like keep using it. And this, this is not only for Gen AI, that also hold, held for, for tools like Kira and, um, and like the, the older AI models. You really need to have a clear vision in mind and a clear goal, what are we trying to challenge that? And I think that's why you see that engagement from the top is so important to get innovation and, and build a culture for innovation, because these kind of mandates is not something that you can, can do bottom up. Like, <laughs> hundred percent. Yeah. They, these the innovation efforts really have to be aligned um, to support the strategic goals of the firm, right? It's um, if in financial services, I, I spent 10 years at Bank of America and they, they did Hoshin planning where at the top level, you have your firm-wide enterprise goals. And then, you know, each department has their goals in support of the broader initiatives. And um, if, there is, if there is strategic buy-in at leadership, for efficiency gains and embracing new technologies like Gen AI, then that's that's going to be the best case scenario. Uh, how much of that do you actually see uh, at this point, or is it still too new to really have made its way into strategy at the law firm level? I have not. It's perhaps the strategy level, but most law firms have raked in big pro still raking big uh, profits um, in the previous year. So then changing the strategy around uh, profitability, that's that's not our thing. I think what you, there I do think you see in the mid-sized firms, you see a huge difference. 
because I think they struggled more and they find more inefficiencies. They are, they see that they have productivity challenges. And so they are looking for ways to find um, a leg up. So I think it's more in the, in the mid-sized firms where you see that change. And it's not only in direction, but it's also in, in, in how do you engage people? Because they're all in the billable hour model, whether you like it or not. And even in a fixed fee model, there are revenue targets. So all these uh, attorneys are under very stringent um, revenue targets and need to produce. So how do you then align that with innovation work, which takes time? And I think we often like to take all that work out of the hands of lawyers. Uh, we can talk, address that separately, but it takes their time. To the left or to the right, these, these innovation, and especially when we talk about productivity, you need to have these lawyers engaged. So how are you going to do that? But we see that most lawyers have, say on average, anywhere between 200 and 400 uh, non-billable hours a year. That seems like a lot, but also a lot that needs to happen in that time from business development to training, to CLEs, to you name um, leadership activities, pro bono work. So it's a finite amount. So I think there's for the leadership very important to say, so how much of that is should go to improvement of the practice? Yes. And, and also how much failure is the law firm willing to accept and embrace in i've been a part of multiple conversations in fact i'm moderating a panel on it in a couple of weeks in new york about um uh this this particular panel is about how ai affects impacts uh organizational design within law firms but we when you peel that one layer back we start to talk about okay where should AI land? Should it be in innovation? Should it be in knowledge management? Should it be a standalone C-suite level role? And you know, during those conversations, you get all over the board in terms of, okay, innovation, It to me, it seems like Gen AI initiatives and innovation are most closely aligned. If for no other reason, just the, the high degree of failure that these initiatives are going to experience, and as an innovation team, if you're not failing, you're not doing it right. There, you have to fail. Innovation require, requires trial and error, correct? What's, what's, a, what's a good, healthy ratio of failure to success? It's interesting here. And I think we need to be very careful here, um, what we say. Like, and to a certain extent, I disagree. I um but let us, let's first get a few facts uh, right. I once did, I think it was for ILTA and uh, also a panel discussion. And we just had like a little poll and we asked like, what is the success rate? And they claimed, um, and this was not a small group. They claimed like an 80 to 90% success rate of their innovation activities, which meant to me like that's crazy because we know like the industry averages are around 20 to 30% when we look at new products and, and completely new initiatives. Um, so law firms clearly, unless it's the most innovative industry, but we started out with that, it's not. <laughs> so, un or they know something that no one else knows. We have too much insiders. We know that's not. So I think a lot of law firms have terrible metrics around their innovation efforts. And I've done a lot of research and I think that's very true to state. Like they start with 15 initiatives uh, in their budget year. And at the end of the year, if five are completed, they're happy about the five, but they don't measure anything. They don't measure where they start. They don't measure how much resources are wasted. So in that sense, I think they have a lot of failure, but that's why I hate the word failure in the, in the sense of innovation, uh, in the innovation context, because this is unacceptable failure. This is just pure waste of money. So the kind of failure you're talking about is learning. And Amy Edmondson had a fantastic uh, article about that. She's a Harvard business uh, school professor about it's innovate the failure that you are seeking is like at the edge of learning so you learn what doesn't work that's not failure 
that's learning what does not work. So I think that's also what you see in these Gen AI pilots. If you pilot Gen AI and you start to look for productivity goals, you quickly will find out what works and what doesn't work. And is that failure? No, it's not. So it, I hate the word failure and I hate to say like you, there needs to be such, such a percentage of failure because I think that just does not rhyme with how law firms work. Lawyers are trained not to fail. They cannot fail. And I think that's much right. more in their way. They like to be perfect. So what I've seen like in, uh, and I don't know if you've like during the COVID, everyone wanted portals, client portals. And what we saw there that the, the strive for perfection in these portals made them fail. And again, like pure failure. Because what they were trying to do, they wanted to build the perfect portal before they even handed it over to the client. Well, that makes it this project last forever. You get enormous scope creep because this needs to be added, that needs to be added. No, I don't like the blue. I think a green would be better. So you can, but what they basically were fighting was their fear of showing this platform that was not perfect to their clients. And they were making up any excuse and, and have the IT department jump through all kinds of loops to kind of hide that fear of imperfection. And so what we had to do with our teams to just push really, really hard and say like, we're not going to build anything. You're first going to go to your clients and ask what they want. And then if, if they, and we help them have the right conversations, then if you have these conversations and say like, we are still not going to build anything. We're just going to have a screenshot and just go back to your clients. Is this what you want? And what would they do with it? How would they work it? And then take someone from IT so they understand to understand the workflow too. And if you then often what we what they start to realize that if you create a portal, especially for forums, for instance, that the general counsel is the one where the law firm interacts with. But these portals will be used by someone in the HR department. So even if they had built the perfect per portal for the general counsel, it would be an utter failure because there will be all kinds of forums that the people that needed that at the client side could not access because, and the general counsel was not going to be like the mail service to hand over these forms. So that's where I think where we need to be very careful is like, what do we call failure? What do we call success? And that's why I prefer to talk about learning. You need to learn as quick as possible. And let's just forget about failure to feel fast to succeed sooner. That's something for startups because they have no reputation to lose and they can fail. And hey, to be fair, like if for a venture capitalist, it doesn't matter. Like it's not their cost, it's not their time. Yet there are many, many poor entrepreneurs who have broken their backs and have nothing to show for, but it's not their cost. So at a law firm where you, it's your employees that are working this, it's your IT department, it's your attorneys, innovation is super duper expensive. And so you can't afford to fail. Well, it's funny and when what, you talk about law firms talking to their clients. I, IT doesn't even talk sometimes to their internal stakeholders. We've had, I've had, we've had engagements where IT has literally said, we don't want you to talk to the users and we don't want you to talk to KM. Here's what we want you to build, which, and at all levels, like some small, some medium, and some really large law firms. So when, when you talk about, embracing you know like client feedback there that concept hasn't even been embraced internally in in many firms in, in many firms and i'm generalizing here there are many firms where they do a great job of capturing and considering voc voice of customer but yeah that's that's not a um i, I that dynamic is doesn't naturally exist in, in no, and, and that's why we need to be so careful to say like you need a certain percentage of failure because if you fail because of those reasons that's pure failure that's that's unacceptable because it's preventable and the same holds for a lot of lot of adoption challenges those are preventable right from the start because if you don't really define the problem that you're solving you will run down the road into adoption challenges and so I would rather say like, let's not afford failure in, in innovation and start with that. <laughs> then that we err on the side of not having too much too, enough uh, failure. So um, speaking of attorneys and, you know, how, how much involvement should they have? I mean, obviously we need their expertise 
right? It, 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 they need to be part of the equation. You, you've mentioned some challenges in terms of time constraints and billable quotas, um, but it's really important to have them bought in, right? Uh, if they're not cooperating with these, you know, innovation initiatives, they become challenged from the outset. But we also need their not, not just to be bought in, but their active participation. Would you agree you with that? You need their active participation, and that's uh, it's the number one thing that from from the twenty plus years I've done academic research, large sample set, like their active engagement is the number one success factor. So if they're not actively engaged. As an IT team, please stop. You're wasting money. It will never be a success. And even in the end, like a law firm delivers law services. So there's only so much that you can improve, like on the back end, perhaps 10% or whatever uh, improvements. But the big improvements come if you can help attorneys, whether it's practices that don't run very well or practices that run very well and, and just want to increase their market share. That's where you should be focusing with your innovation units. You cannot change the, how we practice law without engaging attorneys. And a nice example is it, it, it's also not that you can do it for them. And a nice example is here we had, and we have, this is a case study on our website too, so I can talk about this <laughs> as an example, is we had a team that came to us. They had won the innovation uh, competition in their firm. They were going to build a university um, for their e-discovery team. But they came to us because they said, like, you know, the the success rate of like or the outcome, most of the winners, never, nothing ever happened. But we are desperate. Like, we are so overworked. We need this. This must be a success. Fair enough. So they started, was a, a great team. Uh, they started working, all attorneys, all e-discovery attorneys, and already in the first week, it was clear that even though they had even created the video of what the solution should look like, when I asked them simple things, so like, who will be using this? Um, there was huge disagreement amongst them. So we kind of like started to step back, said, look, so what problem are we trying to solve here? And then through those conversations, it became very quickly, very clear that they were trying to solve their own problem. Because their problem was they were giving white glove services to everyone. That meant that they were totally overworked and um, and were kind of like underperforming because like everyone loved them, but they were not making enough money because they were just spending too much time uh, on every request. That was the problem they had to solve. The university was not going to solve that problem. I can... And since we, we guide so many teams, we see this often at the start, but me seeing that is of no relevance because it's like, if you go to the gym <laughs> and the trainer there, like they can do the push-ups for you, but if you want to become fit, you've got to do the push-ups. You have to learn these kind of skills. You have to kind of like go through it and also kind of like build that accountability in there. So they have to realize themselves that they were their own biggest enemy. And in the end, a frequently asked question table in an email solved 80% of their challenges. And they built, in the end, they built a, the university, but it was for very different purposes. Interesting. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it, sorry, I, I had a glitch on my, my screen. That <laughs> No problem. Well, it, it sounds like what you're describing is just not good alignment and, you know, things having change management disciplines or project disciplines like having a written project charter where you know you've got the goals of the project the stakeholders named a rough timeline a narrative describing what future state should look like to create Absolutely. some common understanding some common understanding and and i think there is where a lot of innovation teams i think are pampering their clients too much because if I create that for them, there's no ownership. And I think what we discussed earlier as well, like the cost of an, knowing in a law firm what things cost. So that was the same for this um, uh, this e-discovery unit. They had no idea what they co are costing or where, where they spend their hours. They had never looked at it that way. And so what we see is that often it's eye-opening, especially for like associates, but even sometimes for partners to work through like, where do, where do we lose productivity? What are things actually costing? And so, and we can, you can keep it very simple. We don't need elaborate spreadsheets. You can 
back of the envelope kind of calculations, but just to understand like an order of magnitude, because we have, and, and truth to be told, that means that often in the first week or two weeks for of teams in our program, they voluntarily stop drop because they see like, this is not worth the effort. Or they see like, oh, wow, if we really want to do this, this is going to take a lot of time. And just for such a small gain, it's not worth it. Vice versa, like, oh, wow, we are losing a lot of money. We better solve this problem. And then you have also that real commitment from the attorneys and the partners. And again, you can do this work with them. They don't need to have to sort out all the, all the numbers, but they need to be held accountable. And I think that brings well, us also to another topic that we discussed, like the return on investment from innovation activities. Exactly. Yeah, and, and Gen AI tools and Copilot, that's a big topic of conversation now with firms that I'm having where I see they're going whole hog with with Copilot, for example, enterprise wide licensing for Copilot. And you know, I when you drill into it a little bit, like, hey, how are you gonna measure ROI? Um, it's not clear. There are some tools that Microsoft gives you around dashboarding and whatnot, but I mean, I think you'd agree that adoption is going to be a key value driver as part of that equation, no? Absolutely. And I think because we often get that question, so how do you measure the ROI of innovation? If you would do it like in the manufacturing firms and the Googles and Amazons of this world do it, a, you, as a law firm, you shouldn't play that game, but that's that's a whole different discussion. So in any in any ways, I think for a law firm, it's already really difficult to to know what the costs are. So to attribute from one particular innovation project, like what the return on investment is based on new clients is very, very difficult. But you can do it in a, very, in a much simpler way. And that's what we have seen cl our clients do very effectively is like for every single project, you create a business case. And that business case is, is made on promises. For instance, like adoption or on productivity gains. So how much productivity gain do you want from implementing Microsoft Pilot? And where should that come from? Should that come from back office hours? Should that come from fewer emails? Should that come from, I don't know. <laughs> but what is it that you want to want to achieve? And then you, you kind of like keep measuring and tracking after the project has been completed and, and up on implementation are we hitting those numbers? Until you've hit those numbers, the project is not done. And so what we've also seen for even like simple software for, um, it was like soft, soft skills, educational software, it was like sold a, a firm wide license and these are the goals. But just tracking use, they saw like, hey, we need every, about every quarter, we need to do some kind of campaign to keep this going because otherwise we'll see the usage plummet. So we need to kind of keep this front and center. And I think that's what you will see with Copilot as well. You need to have very clear goals, start somewhere small, prove that it works, get those use cases going, and then slowly build up the momentum instead of just rolling out licenses and giving it to everyone and then hope for the best. Like, yeah. But again, yeah. hey, if you don't measure anything <laughs> and you don't have accountability, you may be able to get, get away with that. So who am I? <laughs> Well, I think you're, you, you know, you're, you've alluded to having clear use cases and the importance of that in training, but also ongoing support and resources, right? It's not a one-time thing that, especially with a tool that's evolving, so, you know, to use the Copilot example specifically, I mean, there's, I actually see at this stage more business of law use cases that Copilot will assist with than practice of law by a pretty big margin, right? Because all the work product is locked up in a DMS. It's not available to Copilot. And that has well, to get and figured out. I think out. also fair to say, like we, like if you look, uh, we've helped firms like implementation, things like RV and Claw, like they're very, very, very scared of like the learning and, and where their data goes. So as long as they don't know where the data goes, goes and um and i think there's even like in microsoft it is not entirely clear what happens with the data they can't afford that so they're not willing to take any any risk so i think as long as that's the case they are they need to have specialized soft, software to do anything with their use cases we see fantastic um usage um 
again, like you need to, you need to dive really, really deep to find like where the value is in these tools. And I think what you'll also find with um, a lot of the co-pilot stuff, Microsoft called it co-pilot for a reason. <laughs> All of us work uh, a lot individually, and I think that is also the case for lawyers. And so it's fantastic to have someone that's there kind of like as your companion. So instead of like you send, you draft that email and you're like, hmm, did I capture that everything? Let's sleep over the night. And then the next morning you come back and you, look, you, you clear it up a little more. Well, that's often, that's basically a waste of time. Like the, the productivity gain there, it's a long tail, that's, that's very little, but if you can have co-pilot on the evening before, like read with you over that email and ask it, uh, like, does this, did I cover everything? Is there areas I missed? I think you would feel much more comfortable. You may still want to sleep over the night, but then you feel just comfortable just pressing the button the next morning and don't have to kind of like re-go uh, through that whole exercise. So I think there's a lot of value there. Clearly, Copilot can can do much more with all the very complex integrations. Um, I think the sky is the limit there. But again, that requires IT um, to to kind of like link everything together, and how that all will play out, and how stable all these systems will be. You are probably the first to know the moment you tie two things together. <laughs> It will break eventually, <laughs> so you will need to have to maintain that knot. Um, so I think again, like you need to be very crystal clear, like why are we doing this? What is the objective? How much can we invest in making this happen? And how much maintenance will will we um, will this require? And I hope that's one of the things that we learned from this portal. It's not set and done. These things all require maintenance. So, yeah. Think twice yeah. before you start. <laughs> oh, 100%. And not, you know, not just with Gen AI initiatives. I, I see firms go down like custom application development, custom dev routes frequently, and they almost always end badly. And one big reason for that is when they're, they, they don't, you know, and this isn't exclusive to law firms. This is, this is a, um, a very broad issue, but understanding true TCO, total cost of ownership, your initial development and deployment costs are usually a fraction of your total costs. And the reason is um, maintenance and support never go away, right? You've got a finite initial development and deployment timeline, but maintenance and support are forever, and, you know, until for the entire life cycle of whatever it is that you're building. And they those costs typically get underrepresented in TCO equations. And I see it all the time where law firms go down these paths and they build these systems. And sometimes, you know, KM will do it and kind of drop it on IT's lap. And IT is not prepared for, you know, the workload and um, understandably so. But yeah, we see that a lot. Um, and, and that's really why InfoDash exists. We used to do what we do now on a consulting basis. So essentially, we would build a custom law firm intranet and customer would take it over, call us when they need us. And we found that model uh, so much failure in that approach because they just weren't equipped um, or just didn't have the, didn't want to allocate the resources necessary to really maintain um, and enhance those solutions. So it sounds like you've had similar yeah. observations. And it ties, I think, also back to what we mentioned earlier, that the importance of that business case. Because what we see is they balk at spending on uh, external cost, but then they forgot all the maintenance costs that come thereafter. And they also forget to take into account the cost of the people that are involved, whether it's their IT department and especially for their attorney. Usually the none of those costs are included. They only look at the, ex, um, the expenditure that goes uh, goes out the door. Well, if you do that, you basically calculate just like a fraction, like something like 40 to 50% of the total cost of the innovation project, and you don't even look at the maintenance cost. So I think that's where a lot of law firms have a long, long way to go, is to be much more deliberate in where they invest time, whether it's their attorney time or their IT or their KM time, like all this time is finite, it's expensive. And the more innovation 
opportunities there are, the more you really need to realize like where is the biggest bang for the buck because I can only make so many bets, so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the moral of the story is, you know, if I had to kind of sum up much of what we talked about here is truly looking big picture at, at the cost equation and um, investing properly in support, ongoing um, training, all of those sorts of uh, support mechanisms are critical to um, an, an initiative success. So if uh, I know we're almost out of time, but if, if someone wanted to find out more about what you do, how, how would they go about finding finding you like or, organi organizing for innovation, for example? Well, we, we clearly, we have our website organizing for innovation. Um, we, I think it, it's helpful to know, like a lot of what we talked about now is putting those structures in place, the processes and um, to kind of like make innovation happen. That's where we're very good at and helping with the metrics, helping with the guidance to make sure that these projects are not kind of like haphazardly um, happening. But there's a lot of structure behind it and that you also very quickly stop the initiatives that are not going nowhere, either because the attorneys don't have time anymore and or have like some client project came up. Totally fair, that happens. But then stop the project and, and restart it at a later time. So we help them just with the, the metrics. And where they can find us is um, on uh, internet, um, organizing and then with a numeric for innovation.com. Uh, the only advantage of a very weird name as Floor Blindenbeck is there's only one of me on the planet. <laughs> so you can also find me on LinkedIn um, and happy to chat and uh, explain more um, about what we do because it, I think it's quite unique in, in how we uh, can help firms set up basically the innovation function and lift them to that next level of maturity. Well, I think you're you're in a good position because uh, innovation is very much an emerging topic. Uh, I just did a quick analysis, which is actually how we connected. I'm not sure if you realize this, but I, I went back and looked at the ILTA roster from 2014 and said, how many job titles have the word innovation in them? The answer was 16. Gordon was one of them who I connected with, who's a good friend of yours, and then he put me in touch with you. So 14, or I'm sorry, 16 people had innovation in their titles in 2014. Today, at law firms, today it's over 300. So that's quite the lift in 10 years. And it's it's a, um, a that line is sloping upwards steeply. So I think you're in a good position. They're um, in a good position. Well, that, that We did some research there on our end too. And I think that those... Those are what I found very scary facts. So we looked at a sample of 2,700 um, innovation managers and fewer than 13%, one three was more than five years in the job. Mm. Yeah. So and very few, like, and more than 25%, few were like a quarter was just one year in the job. So it could be that that's an emerging trend, but I'm, af I'm afraid like many have very, very short tenures because the expectations of what they should be doing and what they can do are completely misaligned. So if we can solve yeah. a little bit of that, that challenge, that's, um, I hope to contribute with that, with organizing for innovation. Well, good. Yeah. So folks will have, um, that's our target audience, knowledge management and innovation. So they have your contact information and can reach out if they want to find out more. Um, and yeah, let's, you and I stay in touch as well. This is a topic that, uh, I spent years in business transformation roles and in, in financial services at Bank of America, been a lean Six Sigma black belt since 2007. So I am very much a innovation minded person and, um, the work we do at InfoDash is very innovative. Uh, but so I appreciate your, your, your time today and uh, let's, let's definitely stay in touch. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Ted. Uh, I love your podcast. So uh, listen uh, to it with a lot you. of pleasure. <laughs> good, good, good. All right. Well, have a great weekend and we'll chat soon. Sounds good. Thanks for listening to Legal Innovation Spotlight. If you found value in this chat, hit the subscribe button to be notified when we release new episodes. We'd also really appreciate it if you could take a moment to rate us and leave us a review wherever you're listening right now. Your feedback helps us provide you with top-notch content. 
Want to dive deeper into the world of legal innovation? Connect with us online at GetInfoDash.com, where you'll find additional resources and articles. You can also follow us on social media at GetInfoDash to stay updated on the latest news and insights in the field of legal tech and knowledge management. Once again, thank you for joining us today on Legal Innovation Spotlight, a fireside chat series hosted by InfoDash.